statement to the court, delivered by Eugene B. Debs on September 18th of 1918 at Cleveland, Ohio. Your Honor, I recognize my kinship with humanity years ago, and I have made up my mind that I was not one bit better than the meanest on earth. I said then, and I say now, that there is a lower class, I am in it. And while there is a criminal element, I am in it. And while there is a soul in prison, I am not free. I listened to all that was said in the court and supported and led to suspicion of this prosecution. But my mind remains unchanged. I took upon and look upon it, the espionage law, as a despotic enactment in the fragrant conflict with democratic principles and with the spirit of free institutions. Your Honor, I have stated in this court that I am opposed to the social system in which we live, and I believe in a fundamental change. But it is only possible by peaceable and orderly means. Standing here this morning, I recall my boyhood. At 14, I went to work in a railroad shop. At 16, I was firing a firing engine that was fright on a railroad. I remember all the hardships and the privations of that earlier day. And from that time on, my heart has been with the working class. I could have been in Congress long ago. I have preferred to go to prison. I am thinking this morning of the men and the mills in the factories, of the men in the mines and on the railroads. I am thinking of the women for a poultry wage are compelled to work out their barren lives, of the little children who in this system are robbed of their childhood and in their tender years are seized in the remorseful grasp of mammon and forced into their industrial dungeons there to feed the monster machines while they themselves are being starved and stunted, body and soul. I see them dwarfed and diseased and their little lives broken and blasted because in this high noon of Christian civilization, money is still so much more important than the flesh and blood of childhood. And the very truth, gold is God today can rule with pitiless way in the affairs of man. In this country, the most favored beneath the bending skies, we have the vast areas of the richest and the most fertile soils. Material resources in inexhaustible abundance. The most marvelous productivity machinery on earth and millions of eager workers ready to apply their labor to the machinery to produce an abundance for every man, woman, and child. And if there are still vast numbers of our people who still live in poverty and whose lives and unseen trouble all the way from their youth to old age until at last death comes and rescues them and lulls these hapless victims to a dreamless sleep. It is not the fault of Almighty. It cannot be charged to nature. But it is due entirely to the outgrown social system in which we live that ought to be abolished, not only in the interest of the toiling masses, but in the highest interest of all humanity. I believe, Your Honor, in common with all socialists, that the nation ought to own and control its own industries. I believe, as all socialists do, that all things that are jointly needed and used oughtly to be jointly joined. That industry, the basis of our social life, instead of being the private property of a few and operated for the treatment, ought to be the common property of all, democratically administered in the interest of all. I am opposing a social order in which it is possible for one man who does absolutely nothing that is useful to amass a fortune of hundreds of millions of dollars while millions of men and women who work all the days of their lives secure barely enough for a wretched existence. This order of things cannot always endure. I register my protest against it. I recognize the feebleness of my efforts, but fortunately, I am not alone. 
There are multiplied thousands of others who, like myself, have come to realize that before we may truly enjoy the blessings of civilized life, we must reorganize society upon a mutual and cooperative basis. And this end, we have organized a great economic and political movement that spread over the face of all over the earth. There are today upon 60 millions of socialists, devoted adherents to this cause, regardless of their nationality, race, creed, or sex. They are all making common cause. They are spreading with tired and energy the propagandas of the new social order. They are waiting, watching, and working, hopefully, within all of the hours of day and night. They are still in a minority, but they have learned how to be patient and to bide their time. They feel they know indeed that the time is coming. In spite of all opposition, all persecution, when this emancipating gospel will spread among all the peoples, and when this minority will become a triumphant majority, and sweeping into power, inaugurate the greatest social and economic change in history. And that day, we shall have a universal commonwealth, the harmonious cooperation of every other nation with every other nation on earth. Your Honor, I ask no mercy, and I plead no immunity. I realize that finally the right must prevail. I never so clearly comprehend as now the great struggle between the powers of greed and exploitation on the one hand, and upon the other, the rising coast of industrial freedom and social justice. I can see the dawn of a better day for humanity. The people are awakening. In due time, they will and must come to their own. When the marina sailing over the tropic seas looks for relief from his weary watch, he turns his eyes toward the Southern Cross burning lurely above the tempest-vexed ocean. As midnight approaches, the southern cross begins to bend. The whirling worlds change their paces. With starry finger points, the Almighty marks the passage of time upon the dial of the universe. And though no bell may beat the glad hiding, the lookout knows that the midnight is passing. And that's relief and rest are close on hand. Let us people everywhere take heart of hope. For the cross is bending, the midnight is passing, and joy commit in the morning. I am now prepared to receive your sentence.